Hi, AP Bio folks. Today I um starting over. Um, and we're gonna try this on my other computer. Oh, we'll try it here. All right, hello AP Bio folks. Happy Monday. Welcome to the last two days of school for 2020. Um, we are going to kind of wrap up our discussion of cell signaling by talking a little bit more about the endocrine system and specifically about how some of these signaling pathways are regulated and controlled um, within living things. So the endocrine system, if you remember, has to do with um, your hormones and the signals that are sent throughout living things um, to control a whole bunch of different physiological responses. So an endocrine gland is a part of your body that secretes hormones. Um, and depending on the type of hormone, hormones that are water soluble, um, that would mean they're hydrophilic. So again, they can't easily pass through the cell membrane Water-soluble hormones tend to bond to transmembrane receptors on the outside of the cell membrane, but there are also a lot of hormones that are lipid-soluble that can move through the membrane, including the sex hormones, thyroid hormone, and other types of steroid hormones. So these hormones act as signaling molecules um, in endocrine pathways. And so you can see this kind of simplified diagram down here. Um, the stimulus, whatever that may be that starts this, and it could be a couple different things, um, interacts with the receptor protein. And so right in here, you have the first cell signaling pathway as this receptor triggers this endocrine cell um, to produce these hormones and release them into the bloodstream. So that's the response. So you have cell signaling happening within the endocrine gland itself. Then those hormones travel throughout the bloodstream to all different parts of your body, and they affect any cells that have the correct receptor protein. So that was a circle, so we'll pretend it fits in that protein right there. When these hormones bond with the receptor protein on the target cells, they trigger another signal transduction pathway that leads to some kind of cellular response. And depending on what the hormone is and what organ it's targeting, there can be a variety of responses that happen here. And you heard about some of those in the presentations last Friday. Some hormones can have multiple effects from the same hormone. So this is epinephrine, which is one that was presented Friday. Um, and you can see here that there can be different effects from the same hormone depending on um, what the receptor is. So these first two columns, um, it's the same hormone, but the receptor protein is different. This is called an alpha receptor and this is a beta receptor. So they're different proteins. And because the receptor protein is different, the way that it changes shape and, and transmits that signal into the cells is going to be different. In this case, it constricts those blood vessels. And in this case, it causes those vessels to dilate. So depending whether um, that is a cell in your intestines or a cell in your skeletal muscles, epinephrine is the hormone in charge of your fight or flight response. So your muscles need more blood getting to them. They need those, vi those vessels to get bigger so that you can run away. Um, but digesting your food is not quite as important right there. So they constrict the blood vessels by your intestine and kind of slow down that process. Meanwhile, at the same time, epinephrine also acts on your liver cells. That's the third column over here. You can see your liver cells have the same receptor protein as the skeletal muscles. But in this case, the proteins after that inside of the cell during that signal transduction pathway are different um, in the liver cells and the muscle cells. And so in muscle cells, it leads to dilation of those blood vessels. But in liver cells, it leads to a release of glucose, which provides energy, again, to power that fight or flight response. So the same hormone, depending on the proteins that make the receptor and all the pathway after that, um, can lead to different responses in different types of cells. And I just said all those things. So our main topic today is going to be looking at how this type of signaling can be regulated within your body and how we can control it. 
There are different things that can stimulate the release of hormones. Sometimes those signals actually come from your nervous system. There's interaction between your nervous system and your endocrine system. Um, and so neurons might release neurotransmitters that then go and create that very first stimulus that stimulate the endocrine cells to produce hormones and release them. Um, this happens a lot in your hypothalamus, which is a region of your brain that controls the release of hormones throughout your body. That doesn't control every hormone, but a lot of them are controlled through that kind of neurological and endocrine combination. These pathways are, re are controlled through what are called feedback mechanisms. And there are two main types. You can have negative feedback or positive feedback. And this is kind of our main topic today is to look at the difference between these two types of feedback. In negative feedback, the important thing is that you have some kind of stimulus, whatever's happening at the beginning, that causes a signal to be sent. The response then decreases that, that stimulus and kind of returns things to normal and makes that stimulus go away. Positive feedback on the other side, on the other hand, there's still a stimulus that sends a signal, but in this case, the response serves to amplify and create more of whatever that stimulus might be. So we're going to look at several examples of this as we talk through today. I want to check one thing real quick here, I'm trying to see where my drawing tools went to, but I do not know. That's all right. We'll get through this without drawing today. Um, so the first example we're going to look at here, um, these are not in your notes, but this is just to kind of get you thinking about the idea. Um, if you throw a ball, the puppy chases it, and then you rub his head and say, good job. Most likely the next time the puppy's going to go chase the ball again, right? The stimulus was the puppy going to get the ball. The response was praising the puppy, which encourages him. It increases, um, him going to get the ball again. It increases that stimulus. So this is an example of positive feedback, not because I said good, not because I was saying a positive thing, but because it's increasing the chance of it happening again. Um, however, if your brand new puppy pees on the couch, you're going to say, no, bad dog. Um, that's probably going to decrease the likelihood of that happening again. Again, this is not negative feedback because I am being negative towards the puppy. It's because it decreases the likelihood of him doing it again. Let's look at some biology examples. So here you see um, an example of thermoregulation, in other words, re regulating body temperature. Um, take a minute and look at this and see if you can identify the stimulus and the response and can determine whether this is positive or negative feedback. Let's look at the left side of this first. So it says our normal body temperature is 36 to 38 degrees Celsius. The stimulus in this left-hand circle is that the temperature drops. So you go outside in the winter and you're not dressed warm enough or something like that. Your body temperature is too low. That's the stimulus. Your brain senses that and sends out signals that cause your blood vessels and your skin to constrict so you don't lose as much heat. You start to shiver. All of these responses happen which causes the body temperature to increase. Remember our stimulus was the temperature being too low. The response is getting rid of that stimulus. It's making the body, it's making our body temperature less low, if that makes sense. And so because of that, this is negative feedback. It's making the stimulus go away. Same thing on the other side, just in the opposite direction. The stimulus is that our temperature is too high the hypothalamus senses it, sends out signals, and you start sweating and your blood vessels dilate and all that kind of stuff, which decreases your body temperature. Again, this is an example of negative feedback because your body temperature was getting too high. The response decreases that stimulus and brings your body temperature back where it should be. So in either case, these are both negative feedback. Remember, negative feedback just means getting rid of the stimulus. So if your temperature is too low, negative feedback brings it back to normal. If your temperature is too high, negative feedback brings it back to normal. And so I want you to think about this in terms of another um, important concept in living things. Um, some feedback loops can help living things to maintain homeostasis. So 
think about these questions for a minute. What type of feedback would be helpful here? I'm going to talk about negative feedback first. This example we just looked at is an example of negative feedback. And so negative feedback definitely helps to maintain homeostasis. Remember, for homeostasis, your body's trying to maintain whatever you're talking about, whether it's pH or temperature or water levels or whatever, within a certain range. If you get below that range, you want to decrease that stimulus, which means bringing you back to normal. If you get above that range, you want to decrease that stimulus, which means bringing you back to normal. When you get rid of the stimulus, it brings you back to where you were. So negative feedback helps to maintain homeostasis. Positive feedback, on the other hand, is not so much about staying stable because positive feedback, if the stimulus is that it gets high, it, that is that it's going up, whether it's your temperature or pH or whatever, positive feedback would amplify or increase that stimulus so it goes even higher. And the same thing if it falls below, if the stimulus is that it's too low, positive feedback will amplify that stimulus and make it even lower. So positive feedback does not help maintain homeostasis, but positive feedback can be important in other types of biological processes. Here's an example of where positive feedback can be important. During childbirth, one thing that happens um, towards the end of a woman's pregnancy, a baby turns over so its head is down and starts to kind of drop down. And so that movement as well as the baby getting larger eventually starts to put pressure on the cervix. That's the stimulus. It sends a signal to the brain, which releases um, a hormone called oxytocin, which triggers contraction of the walls of the uterus. It starts to squeeze that baby, which of course pushes its head further down, releases more oxytocin, and causes more contraction. This cycle is what causes a woman to go into labor and causes the contractions to increase and increase and increase until eventually the baby leaves her body and the stimulus is gone completely. And that's what stops this. But until that point, this amplifies the signal and makes the contractions of the uterus stronger and stronger, which is necessary um, for the process of childbirth. So that's an example of where positive feedback is important in living things. Um, now we're going to look at a couple of examples from your textbook. So you can see a few places where this happens within the endocrine system. So look at these figures. Um, we'll look at them one at a time on the screen. These are also in your textbook. And for each one, try and figure out what's the stimulus, what's the hormone released, where are the target cells, so what cells actually respond to this hormone, and what is that response? And then are they positive or negative feedback? So in this case, you can see the stimulus is that there's a low pH in the duodenum, which is part of your small intestine. Um, that stimulus causes this endocrine cell to secrete a hormone. This hormone's called secretin. That's that little red circle. Um, the response here eventually is that it releases bicarbonate, which reduces or raises, sorry, raises the pH um, back to where it should be. So like you can see here, this is an example of negative feedback because it's making the stimulus go away. The pH is getting too low. This brings it back to normal. Here's another one. In this case, the stimulus is suckling. So if you think of like babies nursing on their mother, um, that triggers the release of that same um, hormone we just talked about with childbirth, oxytocin, which causes milk to be released, which then is going to cause that baby to suckle more, right? Because now there's milk to drink. Um, so again, this is an example of positive feedback that will continue until that baby decides it's full and it just completely stops. The last thing we're going to talk about is that sometimes with hormones, you have multiple hormones acting at once or in sequence. Um, this is called a hormone cascade. So think cascade like a waterfall. We talked about trophic cascades earlier in ecology. Um, this is a hormone cascade. And so if we look at this figure, you can pull this up in your textbook if you prefer. It's a little bigger and has some more explanation there. Um, what is the stimulus that starts this cascade at the very beginning? 
you can see the very first stimulus occurs up here. Um, and I actually need to check, hang on. Cut this part out of the video. So if you look at this figure in your textbook, the stimulus here is actually that thyroid hormone levels drop below the normal range, which sends a signal to these cells in the hypothalamus to secrete this first hormone, TRH. As you study this, notice how many different hormones are part of the signaling cascade. Just by looking at the diagram, you should be able to tell there's at least three. There's these little red dots that trigger the release of these triangles that travel throughout your body that trigger the release of these little squares. So there's three different types. And then the ultimate response here is that thyroid hormone levels increase, so it starts bringing them back to normal, which makes that initial stimulus go away. So this is an example of negative feedback regulating this pathway. Like I said, there are words on the sides of this that explain all those different steps in your textbook if you want to look at that. In the packet that you picked up with your notes, um, you have a page with a few more examples of this. Um, work on those questions and see if you can identify a couple of these to make sure you understand the difference between positive and negative feedback. I will link an answer key in a note here just in just a second. And please contact me if you have any questions about how this works. I hope you have a great afternoon and I will see you tomorrow.